All right, Genesis chapter 14, please. Genesis chapter 14. We left off at verse 21. We left off at verse 21. Now remember, Abram, now his name is still Abram that time. He's not named Abraham. You're going to find that out later on. But Abram, he was able to whip the most powerful kingdom that time. And Hammurabi, with his ancient Babylonia kingdom, was subservient to the kingdom of Elam, if my memory serves me right. But remember, Elam was the most powerful kingdom, and then Hammurabi, Babylonia, and other two kings were alliance together, were allied together, but Abram whooped them all. So the Lord mightily used his efforts to deliver uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other three uh, cities with a backslidden Christian as well. So he saved a bunch of San Francisco, Silicon Valley people and a backslidden Christian. And these bunch of demon-possessed people still didn't get right with God after that, after they seen the miracle of God's blessing on him and everything. So I want you to notice as we study this text, the mentality of these people they definitely match the wicked people today in the area we live in. Match with these people in Genesis 14. And we're going to see that they match to a T. Look at Genesis chapter 14, verse 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram... All right, so the king of Sodom, remember, he got rescued from Abram. So now he's going to speak to him. Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. So Sodom, he actually offered Abram, you can take all of our belongings. All you have to do is give me back the people. Now notice right here, he's a very good liberal. Did you notice that? He's a very good humanitarian. He was offering him stuff. Now this is very important for you people to understand. Wicked people does not mean that they're all the time wicked in your eyes. That they're bad people. They are people that you can come across who will smile at you and who are nice people who will, you know, help grandmothers cross the street, open the doors. If you have a handful of stuff and they'll be considered nice and then give a buck or they'll do all kinds of stuff for you. I mean, this guy said, you can take all the stuff. Just give me back my people. Now, notice that Sodom and Gomorrah, if you rem recall in your Bible, they're extremely wicked, evil city. But you'll notice right here, wow, what a very nice liberal. See, that's the blindness of this world is that they make you see the good of these people and then you pretend their sin did not exist. But then when you look at their sin with their good, then you realize, especially the sinful part, then you realize, wow, they are wicked, evil people. You got to realize this, mafia... Wicked mafia bosses, wicked mafia bosses, they'll once in a while, they'll see an old lady across the street and help her across the street. Okay, you have to understand that. Even mafia bosses will have a heart somewhere. They'll give free candy to kids. But that doesn't justify their wicked actions of murder, torturing people, and other kids that they've killed. Okay? So you have to understand it that way. Go back now to Genesis chapter 14, verse 22. This is Abram's response. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, so Abram replies to him, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. So Abram, he's saying, I uh, lift up my hand to God. So it's like he's giving an oath to the Lord. It's when he makes a promise to God. So you'll see that in people commonly today, right? When presidents are sworn into office, they'll raise their hand. When you go to court or you're called upon jury, you'll raise your hand. So it's about taking action about what you're going to put a commitment or an oath upon. And he says that uh, he lift up his hand to what? God, who, uh, the Lord, who is the Most High God, who possesses, who owns all of heaven and earth. Now, remember, I'm trying to explain every single word in the verse right here so you can understand the verse that you're reading. The common excuse by people today is, well, the Bible's too hard to understand. Well, to be realistic, it is not, but it is to a first-timer. 
so then that's why we have these verse-by-verse -verse Bible study classes. Once you go through this and then understand every single word as I explain, you'll get the gist of it. Once you get that common sense gist, then you'll, when you read the rest of the verses, you'll understand it. Okay? So that's the goal of this verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. So as I explain, sometimes it may sound repetitive, but I'm explaining because I'm trying to explain every single word there. All right? So try to pay attention and see how it matches. Because like I told you before, I could be lying to you too. Yeah, right. My explanation could be off too. So you have to pay attention. Okay. Let's go out right here. Verse 23. That I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet. So Abram said, remember he said, I already uh, lift up my hand and made a vow or I dedicated myself. I committed that to God that what? He's not going to take a a single thread, okay, that's pretty extreme for him to say that. Or even a shoelace, right? Or a shoe latchet, right? And that I will not take anything that is thine. So he says, I'm not going to take anything that belongs to you. He says, this is important. Lest thou shouldest say. Otherwise, you're going to say, I have made Abram rich. Because they're going to say, see, I made them rich. See, uh, what's a good example? A good example, all right, remember, wicked sinners, what are they? Nice people. Why? We have to think about the oppressed minorities and see what they do, and uh, we want to meet their needs. And then, as a later on in life, right, then they go, oh, Remember, you got, you got to vote for me again because I did this much for this certain black population, the Hispanic population, more than any other guy. Oh, that's the same thing right here with Sodom. You see that right there? Oh, oh you know, well, take all this good stuff. Why? Oh, you must be a nice guy. Well, in his mind, he thinks he's a nice guy, the king of Sodom, but later on, the flesh gets to him, and if Abram took it, he's going to go, yeah, it's because I helped him out. Don't forget what I did. So why would uh, God send judgment to my city after all the good things I did for you, Abram? See, you've got to watch out for that kind of stuff. Wicked sinners think they can get away with stuff just because they do something nice for you. That's wickedness. Nothing justifies sin. That's why God said this. I don't care how, how many good works you commit in your life. You'll still burn in hell because you're a sinner. Yeah, right. Sin is still sin in God's yeah. eyes. That's why God says your good works stink. That's what he says. So he says the only work that matters is my son, what he did on the cross. So you accept that. That's why it's so important to understand that, guys. So remember that these guys... That they may seem nice to you, but because they're flesh, that's so important to understand. All in all, they are fleshly people in their nature. And you guys too. You guys don't get out of the picture. You guys, because you've done something nice for someone, you might think, oh, I did this because I'm a good Christian. But then, trust me, years later, you're going to go, remember what I did for you? It's because of what I did for you, that's why... You owe me. It's like they should owe you on something or they should give you a compliment or something like that. So you got to watch out for that. That's what the flesh does. In the end, the flesh, when you give that nice handout, what you want is something that uh, appeases your flesh, some element of pride and ego is involved. Do you know that this is, uh, this is a matter-of-fact statement that even liberals will admit? You know why uh, billionaires, millionaires give out money? Oh, they're nice people. No, it's their ego. Yeah, yeah. It's the ego. See, I donated what... I don't care how much uh, millions or billions Bill Gates donated. He still has a whole bunch of sins and crimes he has to call out for to the Lord. Yeah. See, don't justify anything. Never justify anything. So that's what wicked sinners do. Now, I want you to look at these passages. Look at, uh, first of all, Deuteronomy 32. Oh, no, we'll go there last. I want you to go to Proverbs 28 first. Proverbs 28. Now, this might sound blasph uh, blasphemous to you, but no, it's going to be Scripture. I'm going to read it plainly from the Scripture later on from Deuteronomy 32. But there is something that God is afraid of. And the Bible actually says that. 
So I'm going to show you that later on. But I'll show you what it is. Look at Proverbs 28. This is what God really hates. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 4. They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law praise the wicked. Is that what it said? What does it say? Content. Well, that's very rude of you guys. I mean, the wicked people, I mean, if they've done something nice to you, shouldn't you do something nice to them? No, the Bible says you got to contend with them. I'm not telling you to be a jerk, okay? If there's some lost person, all right, who helped you carry your grocery bags, don't go like, no, thank you, and then just walk inside. Obviously, you know, the Bible talks about that we have to be kind, we have to have good manners, and etc. But the point is, is that don't get to a point where you think that, wow, these guys are nice people, and you give them that kind of a praise and lift them up to a point where their sin is overlooked, and people don't think that, wow, you know, they don't even think about the wickedness or the lost condition of these people. That's important to understand. You can never, ever forget that. you got to contend with them. All right, here's a good example, okay? So... A lot of you know I graduated from the University of California at Berkeley. And actually, you know, they do that humanitarian stuff, right? So as, as a smart person would, I pulled the race card, right? <laughs> and if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you are poor. And you struggle. And by the way, if you are a Bible-believing Christian, you are helping minorities. You know that? Every Sunday, Wednesday, and so winning... And believe it or not, universities do count that as uh, uh, helping out the community. Believe it or not. All right? I don't know if some of you realize that, but they do count that. I, I know, uh, there's tons of uh, Bible believers that I know of who ended up in UCs because of that. One of them mentioned street preach, and I was like, and you got in? But they counted that. They counted that. So, which is surprising. But anyway, I pulled that card, you know, and then, you know, did the wah wah thing, like, you know, press the minority, and yeah, I was going through a hard time, and blah, 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 blah. And then they, uh, out of all the UCs, that was the only UC that gave me some sort of scholarship, actually. So I didn't get like this guy, you know, because, you know, he's, he's just a computer, his brain. He's not even human, that guy. But uh, at least I had some amount. I had some amount. Also, I had uh, the government to help me out because, look, when you're, from a past, uh, when you're from a pastor's family and that kind of background, you don't make much money. So then we found out that there is a way where government offer resources to help poor people like us. And that actually helped us. Uh, that helped me through college. So then because of that, you know, I obviously give the courtesy and the thanks in return. So then I gave them a donation that one time. Why? Because, you know, they helped me out. All right, wicked university that it is, but I gave them the compliment, right? It's like, uh, so I am not a rude person. I'm not a jerk, okay? I give thanks to uh, if they, the guy did something nice to me. But you know what that university did? They kept mailing, all right? My wife knows, all right? We kept, keep getting mail from Berkeley, and they keep asking for donation, donation donation, donation. Why? Because we help so many students like you and stuff like that. And I'm like, no, I ain't going to give you, I'm not going to even give you a penny. Why? Because see, that's what, you have to understand, that's what the wicked does. And what I have to do is I cannot praise them. You know what I do? I contend with them. I rub dirt on Berkeley. Don't I? I do that all the time. Why? Because of their wicked state. Look, the good that they do for me, I'll accept it and thank them for that. But I'm not going to overlook their wickedness and the wicked parts, I will contend. So you have to understand that about our wicked world. Look, no matter how much nice that they are to you, you can't overlook wickedness and wickedness must be contended. Never praise the wicked on that point. That is important to understand. Never, never Ever, never, ever compromise. There are Christians who, uh, who get so brainwashed by this wicked world system that because, you know, the atheists and then the Muslims and the Catholics and all these guys are nice, 
that they act nice, but then they fall down in that rabbit hole where they compromise with them, where they sit at a table with them, and then they call them like their fellow brother and something like that, that you went far down the road. No, you messed up. You just praise the wicked. You want a good example? James White, he praises the wicked. Why? Because, oh yeah, oh, but you know, I'm trying to debate the Muslims and then uh, try to show them what's wrong with Islam and etc. But I don't mean to, uh, so he doesn't have to act like a jerk, but he went through that nice route at a rabbit hole that now he's, you know, finding camaraderie with Muslim scholars and even Catholic Jesuits, believe it or not. He's not a Catholic. He's not a Muslim. He even... Uh, he even uh, argues against their system. But man, that's what happens when you develop that, when you try to be nice to them and it becomes a rabbit hole. Yeah. The point is this, when you become nice to them, do you have a boundary line somewhere? Do you have, this is it, not right here. Right. If you don't have that, there's something wrong with you. You compromised. Right. All right, I want to stress that very strongly to you guys, Okay. Because you can, uh, that's, the that's why the church fell apart. It's compromise. Never, ever, never, ever compromise. All right. Why? Because at least, uh, atheists recognize this too, is that at least you take a stand. You're not wishy-washy going in between. There are atheists who actually compliment some Christians that, look, I appreciate you taking a stand. I had college students telling me then while I, when I was street preaching. Didn't you know that? Believe it or not, I appreciate you taking a stand. I had a Jew telling me that too. Jew say, he saw me outside in the cold and he's lost, he's an unbeliever, but he saw me outside in the cold street preaching and he said, and I talked to him that one time before, but then when he dropped by again, he's like, wow, he's out there again. And then he just walked by me and he said, hey, I, appre uh, I just want to let you know this, is that I appreciate what you're doing. And I know that before I told you I'm not going to get saved, but I appreciate what you're doing for you taking a stand. You know why? They want to see people who take a stand, who believe what they believe in and act what they believe in. Not like, well, I, you know, because I have to be nice to you and so I, this belief of mine, I have to be nice to that person so then you're wishy-washy. Just throw away your belief then. Something wrong with you. Okay, let's look at... Deuteronomy 30, uh, let's look at Revelation 3, Revelation 3. It's not just the wicked thinking that they've done it, but you yourself too, and you forget the Lord. You forget what God has given to you. Look at Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3. That's the problem, is that when God does the deliverance and he's supposed to be the one that gets all the credit what makes him angry is when the wicked sinners they receive some sort of praise for their efforts he hates that he does not want that and the wicked are praised why because when there's a good result that happens then you give the credit to them rather than the lord and god doesn't want where they take the glory and the praise when the praise should go to Him. Okay? The praise should go to God and God alone, not to the wicked. So then, it's not just the wicked sinners that can take the praise away from the Lord. Another thing is this. When you are increased with the riches, it's not just the other wicked sinners that'll try to take the compliment for themselves. You also are guilty to take the compliment for yourself too. So let's look at Revelation chapter 3. The Bible says at verse 16, this is why you say you don't need the Lord. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. See, God's like, okay, if you don't need me that much, then fine. Because verse 17, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. See that that person says I am rich. I am increased with good. My hand did this. That's dangerous. So then, it's not just the wicked sinners that fall inside this chart right here. It's also yourself. Let's just put me, because that's your favorite word. 
Your favorite word is not Jesus. Your favorite word is me. That's your favorite name. That's your problem, all right? So we'll put me right here. So then when you put me right here, this is what you all share in common with the wicked sinners. Now, I want you to go to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 will show that relationship. It's these two together. All right, now look at how this thing goes, right? How this thing goes and where you share in co common with the wicked sinners. That's what happens when this is all through the increase of riches. We're going to look at Deuteronomy 32, and I'm going to show you that thing that God is afraid of. Look at Deuteronomy 32. We'll look at verse 27. Verse 27. 32 verse 27. Were not that I, what? Feared the wrath of the enemy. What is it? lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, what? Our hand is I, and the Lord hath not done all this. See, that, that's the same thing like the king of Sodom. If Abram took the goods from the king of Sodom, the king of Sodom, who's a wicked sinner, would say, oh, it was my hand that made Abram rich, not God. But we know Abram became rich and successful because of God. But then that promise would have been stolen away and Abram can't give the credit to the Lord if those Sodomites said, oh no, you know why Abram got rich? You know why you Jews became prosperous and all that? Because of us Sodomites. You know why you Christians are doing well? Because of us liberals in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, and you see that? You don't want that on your resume like Billy Graham. Oh, why did you get so many meetings? Why are you so great and all that? It's because, uh, the, uh, thank you, Catholic so-and-so, a Muslim so-and-so, President Bush and Clinton so-and-so for giving me a platform to speak. See, you don't give the credit to God. That's dangerous. That's what happens. God hates that. And that's what he fears. He fears that uh, the works and everything that he's done, the enemy will take some advantage of it and take away that glory from him. Why? Because God, our God, is a jealous God. One thing that makes him jealous and upset and fearful is that his glory gets taken away. He hates that to a T. Now look at Deuteronomy 32 again. And notice at verse 15. Verse 15. But Jeshurun, so that's Israel, wax fat and kick, thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. So with the riches that he got, he overlooked the Lord. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. Look at that. Look at verse 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers fear not. Look at that. The Jews, when they received the success and blessing, they fell for that trap. What do they do? They gave the thanks and the praise to the wicked. That's why verse 27, the wicked say, see, it was us. It was us. It was us. That's why the nation of Israel is great. God hates that. And notice that there is that element of me in there as well. You're going to see me, me, me in there. If you look at verse, let's see right here. Six. Verse 6, do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? If you'll notice at verse 12, so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. So God made it clear, it was me alone, me alone, nobody else, right. nobody in addition. But what happened? At verse 15, they became rich. At verse 18, they were unmindful of God. They forgot Him. You'll notice then at, uh, that God, He had to judge them. At verse 29, 29, Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. No, they don't. 
They don't think about that. That's the problem with uh, Israel. They got so fat and rich that they were like, I did this, I did this, and then they were thinking about other people. We did this for other people. We did, uh, they were thinking that the sinners out there, the wicked sinners did this for us Jews. The wicked sinners blessed us Jews and helped us Jews. And then God's glory was taken. When you look at today, that is evident in Laodicea. That's why I gave you Revelation 3. You're in this category right now. You know who you're, what's going on when you increase your riches? You think about two things. Yourself, and you give praise to them, and then you give praise to them. That's what happens. You see that all over the world. Go to graduation ceremonies and speeches. The students will say thank you, thank you, and what they'll do is talk about me, 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 how good they are, but also them, 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 the wicked sinners that help them. Thank you so-and-so for this and that and that. But no glory to God who helped them through the schooling and education. You're going to hear that in acceptance speeches, award speeches, Hollywood, Golden Globe Awards, Oscars. You know who are the two idiots? This guy and this guy. That's what happens when they get increased with riches. But there is no praise to God. And God hates that to a T. So it's so important to understand that when you go back to Genesis 14, Genesis 14, do not fall for that trap. And you need to, uh, what Abram did at verse 22, he lift up his hand to God. When you lift up his hand to God, when you get the riches, you have to be determined, one, that you are not going to get credit and you, you're not going to do anything that will appease your flesh. Secondly, you make sure that no contribution goes to this. That's important to understand. These two, you got to make sure you got to avoid them at all costs. That way, why? God can get all the glory. God can get all the glory. Right. Now, of course, the Lord, he can use people, others, other human beings, and even wicked people to fulfill his task or to help you with something. The Lord will do that. He used Cyrus, for example, to get the Jews into the land of Israel. Uh, the Lord used Esther through Ahasuerus' power to deliver the people, the Jews. So the Lord can do that. But you have to remember this. Who is the ultimate credit? Who does the praise go to at the end? It's all God. And when you lose that sight and uh, concentrate on people and make sure people get all the credit and glory and you, 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 then you got a problem. When we go back to Genesis 14, <clears throat> it's interesting that at verse 22, Abram, when he made that commitment to the Lord and swore, he said, I have lift up mine hand, Right? Okay, that matches with Deuteronomy 32. Okay, go back to Deuteronomy 32. <clears throat> We're going to look back at Deuteronomy 32. And then you'll notice what the Lord talked about when the people forgot the Lord their God and they gave glory to other people. And then the Lord mentioned right here that there was a lifting up of hand. Let's see. I'm trying to find that verse. It's somewhere here at Deuteronomy 32. If any of you guys find it, uh, let me know. Uh, it's right here. Ah, here it is. Verse 40. 40. 40. Here it is. What did God say? For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. So God, he's... Uh, he puts that, he'll put that hand up if you don't put that hand up. That's the idea. If you won't give that hand up and then give the glory to God, the Lord will do it, all right? God will go, three cheers for me, all right? <laughs> then he'll go, then he'll tell the cherubs, all right, sing holy, 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 all right? So the thing is that there's a lifting up of hand with this issue here. There's a lifting up of hand concerning this issue. So there's no doubt this, this has to do with swearing, putting a commitment or an oath. And then the Lord, he'll when he declares something, he'll do it. So that's important. This lifting up of hand has to do with the Lord declaring something and putting something to action. 
the lifting up of hand. What else is that called? You'll also see prayer as well, that lifting up of hand. That lifting up of hand, you'd be surprised, is also a reference to prayer. Uh, look at th that same wording, lift up my hand, all right? But first, let's go one at a time, go to Revelation 10, Revelation chapter 10. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 10. So the Lord, he lifted up, so let me write down lift up hand right here. So concerning this issue about the enemy should not get the glory but him, he lifted up his hand on it, and that's basically a declaration that's being made. So let me put this in a separate box so you can see how they're distinguished and how it's defining it. Something is being declared. That's what lifting up of hand is, all right? It's being declared, and God puts it to action. Revelation 10 is one example. Notice that there is a being who lifts up his hand to heaven and declares something. And when that declaration is made, God will put it to action. Look at Revelation chapter 10. And notice in verse, uh, let's see right here, 5, thank you. 5, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever. See, so it's putting, it's declaring it, and God's putting it to action. Who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. And guess what? God's going to have no more time. That's what happens at the future in the uh, after the tribulation millennium. So we can see that the lifting up of hand, we know it means to put it to oath. We saw that Deuteronomy 32. We see that Genesis 14. Like there's a promise, an oath being made. But that swearing at Revelation 10 is synonymous with what? When something's being declared, God puts it to action. And that does sound like prayer. When something is being declared, God puts it to action. Now, why do we know that? Because that same word, lifting up of hand, is not just for swearing. It is used for prayer as well. I want you to go to Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Think about it. When a hand goes up and something is being sworn to the Lord and it must come to pass, that's as, that sounds very powerful and as strong as prayer. When something is being declared, it must come to pass. Look at First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, see that? Without, rout, without wrath and doubting. That's referring to prayer. See, those hands are going up. Those hands are going up. Look at Luke 24. Luke 24. Luke 24. Besides, if you use a little common sense, when Abram mentioned, I lift up my hand to the Lord that I will not take a shoe latchet from you, he was praying that same time too. Oh, yeah. yeah, because how can you like get, make a promise to the Lord without talking to him, you know, without praying? So they are synonymous, see? There is a relationship with the two. Look at Luke 24. Luke 24, and notice what Jesus did before he went to heaven. 
in Luke chapter 24, and we read at verse 50. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. We see that right there again. So we see prayers being made where Jesus bestows God's blessing upon them. So a lot of things are synonymous with prayer. We see that over and over again. Go back to Genesis 14. <clears throat> Genesis 14. And then we'll look at verse uh, 24 now. We're at verse 24. So remember, Abram said, I'm not going to take a single thing, but he said this at verse 24, save only, meaning the exception is <clears throat> that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me. So he said, the only exception though of the portion that I'm going to take or the possessions I'm going to take is those that the young men have eaten. So it shows right here that the young men that he brought as his soldiers to fight against the four kings, they've already eaten a portion of their belonging. Why? Because it's a long travel. I showed you at the map where they were, they were chasing them all the way to Dan and then from almost to the Syrian side. And they needed food, so then obviously if they have the spoils of war, it's natural that they're going to be eating it. So they must have already ready eaten it so Abram was saying you know accept that part accept that part and we see an example at let's see right here we go to the book of first Samuel we see an example of that at first Samuel chapter 14 first Samuel chapter 14 notice that this is not a strange thing for soldiers if they were out in battle that they're going to, when they go through the other people's belonging possessions or spoils of war, so to speak, that they will eat it. We have 1 Samuel chapter 14. Notice at verse 32, 32, uh, 31, 31. 1 Samuel 14, 31. And they smote the Philistines <clears throat> that day from Michmash to Aijalon. Uh, so it sounds like they did the same thing like Abram did chasing after the enemy, smiting them from one point all the way from Dan to Damascus. See that, that traveling? So what are they going to do? I'm not hungry. We're not going to eat. No. And the people were very faint. Verse 32, and the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground. They were so hungry that they even, and the people did eat them with the blood. That's how hungry they were, that they committed a sin by eating blood too. All right, let's go to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. So that should not be strange for Abram to make that request at verse 24. Right. So, uh, no, I'm not going to take the possessions except the ones that the young men already ate. So that shouldn't sound strange to you. It will be common during battle. So that's one. The second exception is what? At verse 24. And the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. So notice right here that he says the, the portion of those belonging possessions, let the people who allied with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take that portion. But not me, Abram said, but let those guys. Now this is evidence right here. The scholars, the stupid scholars weren't paying attention and reading. They said, how can Abram be with just a couple hundred servants, whoop out four kings, Dummy, you didn't read verse 24. He was allied. He was allied with other clansmen. Remember I uh, told you that at the beginning verses? If you go back to chapter 14, verse 13. 14, verse 13. There came one that I escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for it dwelt in the plain of Mamre, see that, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol, see, and brother of Aner, and these were what? confederate with Abram. Woo. Dummy, dummy, dummy. They, and these guys have PhDs? You're kidding me, man. I should get their scholarship so I can get a free ride. All right, let's go to Genesis 14. I can do better than them. My goodness, Genesis chapter 14. All right, verse 1. Now, when, and whenever I beat down those scholars, 
and then act all arrogant. I don't want the people to mistake that I think that I'm better than anybody, I'm smarter than everybody. I'm trying to put down their intellect and show them how silly and stupid they are that even an average Joe can do better. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. After these things, so after all of that, all that action, everything was said and done, this is good, all right? This is good. This is going to be the best part in today's teaching, okay? The word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. So then God appeared to Abram in a vision, and then he spoke to him. And what did he say? Good job, you fought the battle well, and no. And he didn't say either that I am going to bless you. No, he didn't say that. He'll say that later on. He didn't say, hey, Abram, let's talk. No, he started out, this is so interesting. All right, I don't know why he would say this, but it made sense to me. Saying, fear not, Abram. Those are two, one, one of the uh, best words in the Bible yeah. is fear not. Yeah. You'll see that all over your Bible. Fear not, Abram. He told him not to fear. Now, why is that? This is so interesting. Now, I think that, uh, uh, I think the women are really going to get a blessing out of this because I know sometimes that uh, the wives and the women don't feel understood by their husbands at times. <laughs> So uh, when that happens and you feel like no one understands you, what you're going through, right? This is amazing. God understands you. Now, when you go through a hard time and then, ladies, I know that the husband doesn't really understand. They're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then you're like, but you don't understand. And like, yeah, yeah, okay. You just got to tough it out and we got to do this for Jesus. You know, you heard what pastor preached on being a soldier of the Lord. And then like, oh, you just don't understand. Like that. When God understands. So. No. <laughs> okay. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. All right. Moving on. Moving on. All right. You know, maybe I should skip this verse. All right. Let's, let's go to verse two. Now, now, the Holy Spirit wants me to talk about this. Now, look at, look at this, guys. Okay, this is amazing. Abram did not tell the Lord what he was afraid of. Now, I, I, look, I'm married. I know what that's like. Honey, what's bothering you? I, ah, okay, look, just tell me. And la, da, 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 da. No, that doesn't make sense to me. No, that's a dumb thing to do. And then you try to explain. They're like, no, you really don't understand. It's this, this, this. No, I do understand. I try to explain to you. No, you really don't understand. You go, ah! Yeah. <laughs> All right. But here's the thing. God understands. And Abram didn't have to say it or explain to him what he was troubled. Now, Abram... He was what? He was like just typical, like some people, they would just pour out what they were, you know, what's bothering them, right? Verse 2, that was his fear. Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless in the steward of my house, this is Eliezer. See that? About, he's still troubled about not having a child. But Abram never told him. Abram never told him before. Another thing, Abram won a huge victory and a battle. What's bugging him, man? Why would you be afraid, Abram? What's bothering you? I mean, you just got a big victory. Whooped four kings. Four kings who are historical figures, man. Hammurabi and those guys. He beat them all. How was he able to... How can he overlook and be afraid of something? Well, God understands the deep-seated emotion and the fear that other people don't understand. God's like, you know, in spite of all this, I know what's bugging you. You don't have a child. So then God just came down and just said, fear not. That's, that's a great verse. That's a great verse, guys. That's a great verse. You never saw the context. There is no context behind chapter 15, verse 1, why God said that. There's no context behind it about what Abram was troubled by or something bad happened to him. No, he got everything great. 
we, don't, uh, we find out the context after God said, fear not. After he said, don't be afraid. That means he already knew. He didn't even say, Abram, what's bothering you? No, he already knew. Verse 2 and 3, Abram's just spilling his guts. That's it. All God said is, fear not. And then Abram, because he sensed that, then he's like pouring out his deep-seated emotion. Lord, what am I going to do? And stuff like that. Isn't that something? That's the Lord. That's the Lord. God knows. Why? This is encouraging to you. Because it's, it's the Holy Spirit's job. Go to John. Go to John. This is good, guys. Go to John 14. John 14. It's his job. Now, wives, and including husbands too, sometimes husbands can feel that way too, your significant other, you might think it's their job to understand you and to try to help you out with your fear and to comfort you, but guess what? It's not going, uh, uh, it may be your significant other, and yes, it may be our role to help you out, but guess what? That's not going to be the main job you better depend upon. It's God. It's God. God, that's God's job. That's not my job, and that's not the significant other's job. It's God's job to, to truly understand what you're going through and help you out. Guys, he's not, yeah. <laughs> know this, you, you should not be afraid. Why? Because that's God's 24-7 job. And by the way, he's not being paid for it either. Can you believe that? God's doing this pure love, purely free for you. That's his job, man. Man, look at John chapter 14. What a great God. That's his job. It's so awesome. We're going to look at verse 16. Verse 16. The Bible says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another what? Comforter. A person who comforts you, who says, Fear not. Why? Because John chapter 14, verse 1, what did Jesus start out with? Let not your heart be troubled. That's another word for fear not. Why did Jesus start out that way? Because he's trying to tell them, I'm going to send you the comforter at verse 16. Even the, look at verse 17. Verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he what? Dwelleth with you and shall what? Be in you. Of course he knows how you feel. He's in you. He knows how that heartbeat is going blah, 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 every second. And then what your flesh is feeling and what the imaginations are running in the mind. Of course God knows. He's inside you. If you look at verse 26, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom, uh, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. See? Fear not. Neither let it be afraid. Again? Fear not. That's his job, all right? All right, go back to Genesis 14. That's awesome. I can give you another verse on top of that that you all know. At Romans chapter 8, verse 26, 27, 28, what's the Holy Spirit's job? Where you can't even pray what you should be praying for, but the Holy Spirit feel, feels and knows your infirmities, what you're struggling with. See, that's his job. Before you even say it, the Holy Spirit already knows. You know that? Hey, let me give you something better than that. Our God is all-knowing. He already knew what you're going to know later on. That's awesome, right? It's like, you know, God from out in eternity. All right, Genesis. All right, Abram's going to beat them, beat them. Beat. Watch, watch. Genesis 15, 1. In spite of that victory... You know, in spite of a blot that just a happened, Abram's going to go, oh, it's, so, it's so troubled, you know, it's so hard, and no one understands me, I can't tell anybody. So 
And then I'm going to come down at Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, and I'm just going to say, fear not. God knows exactly what you're feeling before you even know yourself, before you even say it. I mean, Abram didn't pray to the Lord. The Lord came to him. That's encouraging, isn't it? How many times have you were, uh, that's his job. How many times have you were in fear and you even failed to pray? You even failed to seek out the Lord, but then the Lord was the one who first approached to you and said, fear not. How many stinking times, you weak flesh, you? It should be your job. If you need help, then you need to go to him. But God, he, what a great God. He just comes to you. There are many times he did that for you and I, didn't he? What a great God. All right, so why shouldn't you be afraid? If you keep reading down, fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. The reason why you shouldn't be afraid, and this is why everyone struggles with fear. Fear is a horrible thing. A Christian should get victory over this. But there are several elements that will help you overcome this fear. All right? So as I cover this, Oh, okay, I'm too high. Thank you so much for letting me know. Keep letting me know. That way nothing uh, is taken away, all right? So there are several things uh, you want to know in order to overcome fear. One, know that uh, be in peace and in comfort and know that it's God's job. It's God's job to comfort you. even when you don't know it. There are times that uh, I, uh, I can be so strong for the Lord that I don't, uh, that my unconsciously, I don't even know that I'm hurting. You know that? Yeah. And then the Lord, he knows that. Yeah. And then he'll comfort you. He'll, sh- he'll, he'll, he'll go, hey, you need a break. Or he'll put a preaching and then open your eyes and say, you hear me speaking to you. Or you're reading your Bible and you go, oh, Lord, I needed that. I didn't realize. See, the Lord does that. It's his job. He'll do it when you fail even. Two, another thing is shield. That's why you shouldn't fear. It's because you have a shield. And this is why you fear. Go to Ephesians 6. You know what that shield is? The shield of faith. Now, God is your shield, right? But there is something tied with your faith right here. God is your shield, but how it ties to your faith is your faith is in God. It's not faith in yourself. That's what the world is teaching you. You go mad. You're stupid. The past two years, how much faith you have in humanity after that? You you got to be crooked and messed up, man. How much faith do you have in humanity? Oh, man, it's so hard to be a Christian, etc. You're mad, man. It's good to be a Christian. Don't be a Christian then. Have so much faith in yourself and in humanity, and let's just see how well you do. You're mad, man. Mad, mad, mad. You need God. If there's one thing I learned with the hell that I've been through, I need God, and only God. And I mean that, only God, all right? So, if God is our shield, and the Bible also says the faith is the shield, what's the relationship? Down here. The faith is in God. That's why. That's why you're able to overcome the fiery darts of the wicked. Because of your faith. But it's not faith in yourself, it's in God. So now you have to look at Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. That's why you shouldn't fear. That's why God said, I am your shield. That's why you shouldn't be afraid. Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 16. Above all. Now, isn't that interesting? Above all the armor right there, right? That means this is a protection. This is a huge essential armor. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Why? Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Why? That wicked one is fear. Fear, 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 fear. And the only way that you can 
take that head on, but you're still shielded, is your faith right here. But that faith is in God. That's why you're afraid. You, it's so simple. You don't trust him. You don't trust him. It's that simple. You go too much by sight, not by faith. When the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. You need to see security. You need to see big amounts of money. You need to see a prosperous life. You need to see doctors saying, hey, I got good news for you and everything will be all right. You need to see people patting you on the shoulder, patting you on the head and saying, oh, I'm there for you. See, it's all, that's flesh. You have to uh, shun those things out and, real, and only see that uh, you need to shut your eyes once from away from this world and just stop what you're doing and then just try to see that hand of God down on you and say, you see me now, child? We walk by faith. The only way you can see that is obviously not directly. It's by believing. It's by faith. You don't remember his word. You don't recall his promises. You forgot the preaching that helped you. I mean, you just, uh, and you just forgot the Lord. You just didn't believe in him anymore. All right. Go, uh, going back to Genesis 14, a third thing why you shouldn't fear is because of God being our exceeding great reward as well. Now, you notice it's not just an award. It's an exceeding great reward. Notice it's not like God says, Okay, here's a, little, uh, here's a little Oscar and then some idiot actor actress who blew uh, his or her brains off or family sacrificed everything for a stupid little, you know, stone goes, Oh, thank you so much! I want to take the Academy! And this is the best thing in my life! That is the most silliest, stupid thing ever, you know. People literally die for a stupid thing like that. Man. God's not that type of God. He don't just give you, okay... Here's a little Golden Globe Award. You're done. Aren't you happy? No. Exceeding great rewards. Look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Why shouldn't you be afraid? Because he's, he's going to bless you. He's going to reward you. And he's more than good to you. You don't count your blessings. That's why you always get afraid. You count all your negativities. And you're very good at that. You do have a PhD. Your, your PhD is counting all your negativities. And you're a failure in your school. You are a failure in not counting your great rewards from the Lord. If you start doing that, fear subsides. And not only that, sometimes you see that your fear is actually petty. That's what happens. Like Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, you know, some people ask me, how do you pastor here? It's a mad thing, you know, and how we survived. And yeah, I keep asking myself that question. And then when future trials and hardships come up, whether it be from uh, the city, the local counties, and then the online uh, and the globalists and everything else out there, what keeps me going? What makes me not lose fear? I remembered every single time he rewarded us. Every single blowout he rewarded us. And you think that I'm going to be afraid now of what they're going to do? I remember how he took care of us, gave us a building, gave us people, gave us the money, gave us... Look, I've seen too much already. What is there to fear? Now look at Ephesians chapter 2, but you just forget that. You don't think about that. Ephesians 2, verse 7. If God is our great reward and he's in us, Notice what's his job. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the what? Exceeding riches of his grace in his what? Kindness toward us. He will be kind to you. Can I tell you that? He will be kind to you. All right? He's going to be kind to you. And that's why his riches are exceeding. Look at Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Not just exceeding riches, it's above that you can even ask or even think. The Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 20. Verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do what? Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Well, I think God proved that at Genesis 15.1. Before even Abram asked or thought, God just said, fear not. 
All right. Now, don't be afraid. All right. You got a great God. I don't, uh, there's nothing to be afraid about when you got a great God. Literally, I mean, just uh, literally, if I just stretch out my hand, I'm already uh, touching the Lord right there. He's everywhere. That's how close he is. He's so close that he's actually inside you guys. All right. I mean, if you're a part of him, like you're, you're so literally a part of him through that spiritual world. I mean, uh, what is there to fear, right? God, my father, I want to thank you for your word. And thank you so much <clears throat> for a word full of promises, a word that can help us to learn and spiritually grow, and that your book, that each and every word has meaning, and it's not hard to understand. I pray that the people got a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.